Hey everyone, uh, we have Chow here from DeFi Alliance and he'll be doing a talk on what DeFi projects don't know about market making, but should. And I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I currently lead uh, the DeFi Alliance, uh, which uh, originated in Chicago. Um, we uh, currently have a, uh, an accelerator program for um, DeFi startups. So some of the startups that went through our accelerator program include Synthetics, Kyber, Zero X, and uh, uh, perhaps a dozen others, right? Some of the largest and, and most uh, well-known uh, DeFi startups. Um, and what we do is to provide liquidity um, and uh, knowledge network uh, and sometimes funding for uh, these startups. Um, previously, I was, um, I was part of the founding team at Masari, which is a crypto data research startup uh build out the uh the product and the uh, technical te technical team there and before that i was a professional market maker a uh, high frequency trader alcohol trader uh there are many different terms that describe uh sort of the same thing but i've done that for almost 10 years uh professionally uh but also on the side i've always been involved with the crypto community so i've seen a little bit of both sides of, of the story um, and today's topic, uh, we're going to talk about market makers in the context of, uh, of DeFi. Um, so it's a super timely topic uh, if you've been uh, following the latest uh, drama on Twitter between the, uh, the pro-AMM people and, and the anti-AMM people. Um, I, I realize there's such a massive misunderstanding of how uh, market makers work, especially in, in crypto. So this is a really... A uh, great time to talk about this. And by the way, the audience, if you, uh, you know, we can make this very interactive. If you want to ask questions in the chat, I can see all your everything that you're typing. So, um, so feel free to ask me questions. I can uh, address them as we go. So, um, I guess maybe a, a quick uh, introduction uh, for market making. What is it like? Uh, what's a day like in the day of uh, of a market maker? Um, so market making is probably, uh, the most technical, uh, kind of trading or trading strategy. Uh, it's, it's, um, it requires massive amount of, uh, investment in technical infrastructure, uh, including, uh, you know, software, uh, hardware network, uh, and all that stuff. But also, um, it's it's very quantitative. So, uh, in reality, a market maker you can think of it as a as a data scientist with a very direct uh, skin in the game. So, on a daily basis, uh, the kind of work that a market maker does is very much uh, that of a data scientist. So, they gather a lot of data uh, from exchanges, from you know other sources, uh, analyze them, uh, study the anecdotal examples. And sometimes they also run back tests. So they run like uh, they use historical data to uh, back test uh, specific strategies. Um, so it's very much a, a data science work. And um, uh, as, as you may know, the, the, the data quality in crypto is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, nowhere near the, the quality of uh, traditional markets. So it's. Uh, they spend a lot, like these market makers, they spend a lot of time cleaning, gathering data uh, in order to be able to analyze them uh, in an objective way. Um, so that's what they do. Uh, I mean, you know, th the day to day is 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 very technical. Um, it's it's data science data science work. Uh, but uh, occasionally, they also need to do a lot of work on the uh, operational side. So, like you know, once every year, once per year, you got a huge. Uh, um, you know, huge uh, you know, uh, market condition, like super volatile market condition. And um, these are the days where the market maker can make a lot of money. Like most of the days are kind of boring, you know, especially over the last 10, 10 years in traditional markets, it's been pretty boring, right? Like it's volatility has been like around, like, I don't know, sub 20, 20% uh, 20 uh, annualized. Um, but this year, especially because of COVID and, and, the, and the deflation, uh, it's been a great year for market makers. So they, they probably spend a lot of time uh, doing operational work, uh, making sure that their system is robust, tweaking some parameters live, and so on and so forth. So, um, oh, by the way, someone asked me, like, 
which MM did you work with? Uh, I'm not currently market making in, in, in crypto right now, but previously I uh, I worked at uh, Tower Research, um, which is uh, uh, one of the top uh, trading firms in the world in terms of market share. So like most of these prop trading firms are super um, low profile, so to speak. Like they don't want to talk about what they do because it's very competitive. It's a very competitive game and um, they're low key, but they're, you know, a, a top market making firm tends to be responsible for about, you know, two to 5% of the entire stock market in terms of trading volume. And on an annual basis, that's like about a trillion dollars per year. So it's uh, pretty substantial. Um, so as I said, it's a very competitive game, but um, I mean, it pays well, but it's not like, you know, in a good year, you can make seven figures. Uh, I mean, if you're the lead of a, of a desk or a company, you can make eight figures or even, I don't know, maybe nine potentially, uh, if you're like uh, the co-founder of Jump. <laughs> Um, but uh, jump, jump trading, by the way, is another very big, uh, one of the top uh, derivative market makers in the world in traditional markets. They're also very big in crypto. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a typical, an average market maker doesn't actually make as much money as people think they do. Um, and if you, if, you, if you look at the total uh, profit, or I guess gross profit, not, not net profit, gross profit, gross revenue, of all the market makers in the world on an annual basis, they make maybe a couple billion dollars per year, uh, which, by the way, is uh, less than the bonus pool of Goldman Sachs. So it's, it's not that much money. I, I mean, two billion sounds like a lot, but like it's, it's across many dozens of uh, trading firms and uh, thousands of, of people. It's not that much money, to be honest, compared to like Wall Street, your typical Wall Street uh, firm. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a lot of hard work, hard, hard technical work. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it pays uh, reasonably well, but it's not a huge amount of money. Um, so, um, you know, that's what market makers do. You know, they trade very frequently. They make markets, they provide liquidity. Sometimes they take liquidity as well. Um, they're big in terms of volume. Uh, the net result of uh, market making activities is, uh, I guess, a lot more efficient market. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, 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 it's something that people tend to say, um, but like what market efficiency really means uh, from a market making point of view is that the bid ask spread uh, they tend to go down over time with uh, more and more market making activities. So there there is a lot of data that you guys can Google. Uh, and, and see how uh, you know the beta spread on traditional markets has uh, improved uh, dramatically over the last 20 years, basically since the beginning of uh, the um, digitiz digitization of markets, uh, which ultimately led to more uh, alg algorithmic market making market makers in the market. So beta spread has improved dramatically. Uh, it's definitely true in crypto as well, and uh, it benefits uh, pretty much everyone else uh, because uh, the other side of the trade, uh, basically the counterparties of the market makers, is that um, they're liquidity takers. And the bid, bid ask spread, a narrow bid, bid ask spread means uh, basically a much better um, uh, you know, uh, slippage or transaction cost for the takers. So the takers can be you know, institutional traders, but, but also like retail traders. So it benefits everybody. Um, and that's one of the things that like people don't really understand about market making. I mean, there, by the way, there's a big overlap between the term market making and the term uh, HFT, high frequency trading, because uh, market makers generally are high frequency traders. They're high frequency, like they make a lot of trades uh, uh, throughout the day. So, so there is a... a an, a pretty negative sentiment towards these people, towards market makers and high frequency traders. I guess it probably stemmed from uh, this book that uh, Michael Lewis, uh, th this famous writer, wrote a, a few years ago, which is called um, uh, The Flash Boys, right? So many of you have probably heard of this book and, and many of you have probably read it. But that book was, was full of um, uh, factual inaccuracies. I mean, in a way, it's true that market makers, especially the high frequency ones, they have some unfair 
uh, advantage over the rest of the, the market uh, by being very fast, uh, by being faster than everyone else and get the, the trade faster than, than everyone else. But they get these, these edges uh, not for free. They spend a lot of money investing in infrastructure and technical talent and software and hardware and all that stuff. It doesn't come for free. Um, and at the same time, uh, the money that, ma that they make is a highly, uh, it's highly operationally leveraged, meaning the cost of this infrastructure is very high. And in a bad year, their gross profit can be low enough that their net profit after all those costs is basically zero. So um, at the same time, they provide benefit to the rest of, of the um, uh, market participants in terms of um, in terms of uh, you know transaction cost, so um, it's sort of one of the most misunderstood um, uh, misunderstood uh, group of market participants. Um, so uh, someone asked about Hummingbot. Uh, I don't know that much. I mean, there are two, a couple of people asked about Hummingbot. I, don't, I actually know the founder. Uh, I've, we've spoken in the past, but I actually don't have a ton of in insight into it, unfortunately. Uh, three people asked for it. Uh, I'm very sorry for <laughs> for not being able to ask to answer your questions. Um, but uh, uh, so that's that. Oh, uh, someone else asked: uh, Is MM limited to high net worth individuals and big or organizations? I'm not sure what this means exactly. I mean, the the, the market making market maker market making firms. Um, I mean, they tend to be prop, right? By prop, I mean they they trade with their own money. So they're not, they don't take LP money. They don't take uh, limited partners money, outside money, so to speak. Um, I mean, the owners of these market making firms are the successful ones, is the high net worth. Um, and um, I guess, are they big organizations? I mean, the size of a typical, uh, I guess, top 10 market making firm might be around, I don't know, 500 people, like sometimes maybe couple of thousands, like the really big ones. I mean, uh, what, what's the name? Um, uh, a few years ago, uh, Knight Capital. Uh, Knight Capital, uh, at, at the peak, of the, there might have been over a thousand people. Also Citadel currently. Citadel is, is definitely, Citadel Securities, which is uh, one of the top market making firms in the US. Uh, they're probably, um, uh, actually don't know how many people, but maybe, maybe over a thousand. Um, including all the technical talent and operations and, and traders. Um, what's the best way to get started in market making? Well, you don't want to do that by yourself. You want to join a really successful company and learn from other people. And, and this advice is true in general for trading. It's not just market making. It's just true in general. You want to get advice. You want to get help and mentorship from someone who has done it. You don't want to try to figure stuff out from scratch. Trading is an extremely competitive game, especially uh, market making. I can speak for market making in, in particular. Uh, you don't want to get started. You, you don't want to do this on your own, right? You want to learn from uh, people who have done it. Um, and then as a bad rep, as a, as a market dumper for token sale project, do you guys get insider enough? Um, I mean, it depends on the type of market makers again. Like some, some people, some market makers uh, do make market making for like, you know, new tokens. And what do they, what do they do? I mean, they, market make, by the way, market makers are market neutral. They don't want to take directional risk. They don't dump, they don't dump on retail. Like it, I mean, dumping on retail means you're taking directional risk, risk by, I don't know, getting early in a deal or something. And then, um, you know, they take directional risk and, uh, and uh, you know, they make profit on, on that. Market makers don't do that. Market makers are market neutral. They don't take. They don't want to take uh, a lot of risk. They are extremely risk neutral people. Uh, they literally just, you know, make spread like you know they bid and, and and they offer. That's it. They try to stay as flat as possible in terms of uh, position. So uh, so that's that. Uh, yeah, keep 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 going with your questions, but uh, let me. Uh, continue with uh, with uh, uh, stuff content that I've prepared so far. Uh, in particular, something that's super relevant for DeFi projects is that 
historically, it's been very difficult to onboard professional market makers. So if you look at the volume of some of the largest DeFi platforms, right, like decentralized exchanges, um, most of them uh, only took off this summer. Before this summer, it's been, um, the volume it has been pretty negligible compared to centralized exchanges. And part of the reason is that uh, it's been very difficult for these DeFi projects to onboard professional market makers. Um, why is that? Well, number one, there's a huge opportunity cost for these uh, professional market makers. So they can trade you know, hundreds of, of markets. They have access to hundreds of opportunities or markets around the world where they can make a, a lot more money uh, than, than in crypto or in, in DeFi in particular. So the question is, why would they spend so much time investing in, in a new platform, right? It, it's, it's a huge amount of opportunity cost uh, for them. Um, number two, uh, the thing that these professional market makers really look at, uh, like something that's really important for them is their retail flow uh, on a particular uh, DEX or decentralized exchange. In order to decide, to make a decision to go all in on the decentralized exchange, they need to look at how much retail flow there is on that uh, decentralized exchange. Why is that? Because they're the counterparty. They're the counterparty to these retail traders. The more uh, retail traders there are on a given platform, the more they can trade against and the more you know, uh, you know, uh, spread they can make, right? It doesn't mean that retail traders lose money. It just means that um, th their flow are less uh, informed, less toxic, uh, which is generally more juicy for, uh, for market makers. Um, so, uh, you know, give you one example, like FTX, uh, everyone who, who traded on FTX as a, I guess, a high frequency market maker knows that in the early days of FTX, there were a lot of sharks and very few fish. So if you trade on FTX as a professional market maker, you're not going to make a lot of money because you're competing, you're trading against a bunch of sharks. Um, and that's why I, FTX recently, I guess, maybe a month ago acquired uh, Blockfolio, right? The, um, uh, the portfolio uh, tracking app uh, and use Blockfolio as the top of funnel for, um, for their uh, uh, exchange, FTX, right? In order to attract more retail flow. So that's super important uh, for, uh, like the, the amount of retail flow is very important for, for market makers. And finally, um, you know, uh, historically, I guess most of the DEX, DEX projects, they didn't really focus on onboarding uh, or making the onboarding experience a really um, you know, smooth experience for, for market makers. I guess they just haven't got the time to focus on it. But the main thing there is you want to build uh, an API uh, where market makers can connect to uh, that is easy to use, uh, very well uh, documented, uh, because it's a lot of work to connect to a new, new exchange, a lot of technical work. Uh, you want to make the, the experience as simple as possible. But historically, I guess uh, that has not been the case, but I'm seeing more and more, um, more and more uh, um, DEX projects do that. So I think you know people who focus on, on this, uh, making the onboarding experience a pleasant one for market makers, they will have an edge. Um, but anyway, so uh, I want to go back to some of the questions. Uh, I was uh, so someone asked. I was under the impression that low volatility is good for MMs, while sustained movement in, in a direction is bad. Can you expand on why you say that large market, market moves are good? Well, it's very simple because market making is not just passively providing liquidity, right? There's a lot of market makers who also take liquidity. I mean, in fact, most market makers in, in crypto, like the super high frequency ones, I would imagine that they do, you know, every time they, they get hit, like when they provide passively provide liquidity and, and get hit, they would you know also take liquidity somewhere else in order to hedge. So um, large directional movements uh, can be good for market makers, uh, and, and also that's one of the biggest misunderstanding about market making. Volatility is bad for market making market makers on Uniswap, uh, but uh, for the professional market makers, it's usually a really good thing. And that brings us to the uh, to the next topic, which is how did Uniswap take off? 
this year. So I'm personally really a big fan of Uniswap. Like I, I'm, I'm publicly, I guess, bearish, long-term bearish on the idea of AMMs. But I am a big fan of Uniswap. And I can tell you why Uniswap really took off this year. I mean, a lot of people probably know this, but let me just uh, reiterate uh, some of the points that people generally don't talk about. Number one is AMMs, they fix the onboarding problem that I just described. They make the onboarding process for liquidity providers a lot simpler, right? Like if you have an order book and you want to onboard liquidity providers, you have to make the documentation really well, uh, like API really nicely documented and all that. So like it's a ton of work. But on Uniswap, a liquidity provider does, only needs to click a, a few buttons. Like any retail person can do that. So it's very simple. So instantly you get a lot of passive liquidity. And number two, on the other side, right? So you, you fix the passive liquidity problem. And then on the other side, you, 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 wanna, you wanna tackle the taker problem. And the way Uniswap data is to make the UX extremely simple for, for takers. So like, you know, if you go on Uniswap and you wanna make a trade, you're essentially, you're by, de by definition taking some liquidity. And that experience is very simple. Like Uniswap did a really good job. Um, building a nice, simple, intuitive UI for these uh, aggressive liquidity takers. So all of a sudden, you've bootstrapped a, a two-sided network, right, between the takers and the makers. And that's how Uniswap, uh, you know, managed to, to get a lot of volume uh, this summer. And obviously, that was helped by the fact that, um, you know, this summer, there was a lot of new, like, DeFi shitcoins or you know, like some of the new, like, experiments and experimental tokens, which are generally late to, uh, to get listed on, on centralized exchanges. Like centralized exchanges, they tend to prioritize things that they feel uh, are, I guess, you know, uh, mature. Whereas uh, on a DEX and especially in, in Uniswap, um, a new token gets listed, can get listed automatically. So uh, that was one of the reasons why uh, Uniswap was uh, was really uh, was really hot this summer. So um, I've so I, I said a lot of good things about Uniswap, and I want to maybe describe some of the issues with AMMs because I think these issues are useful for founders uh, in the long term. Because um, due to thanks to Uniswap's success, uh, almost everybody who are launching decentralized uh, you know exchanges or or any, any sort of DEX products, they're looking at AMMs. Um, but I want to describe these problems so they're, so they're aware uh, in, in the long term, what, what are some of the challenges they might face. So number one is the AMM algos are extremely, are fully transparent, right? So it, it's, the, the analogy there is like, you play poker and you show your hand pre-flop. And what happens there? Like everybody else knows your hand and they can, act accordingly. They don't have to call your raise or, or, or I mean, they basically know your hand and they can act accordingly. They can play better than you because because of this information asymmetry. So the same thing there, the same thing happens on AMMs is that there's an information, information asymmetry between the makers and the takers. The makers show their hand. So in the long run, it's going to be very to toxic for, for the makers. Um, another problem is, um, these AMMs are governed in a very decentralized way, uh, you know, by a large number of token holders. The consequence of that is, uh, number one, um, they're slow to react to changing market conditions. And number two, they're slow to, uh, to innovate compared to uh, the centralized market makers. Market making is a game that you don't need thousands of people to play. You only need a few people who really know what they're doing. Um, and uh, they can coordinate with each other a lot better. They can figure out the game. They can innovate much faster. So uh, some of these problems like, are, are things that people don't really realize at this point. But in the long run, I'm fairly confident it'll play out. Um, the takers will be smarter uh, than makers uh, in the long run. And it will make the flow for makers a lot more toxic. So. Um, those are some of the potential issues with AMMs, but I'm always of the view that uh, just because something doesn't necessarily work in the long run doesn't mean you don't do it today. And that is because product development is not, is not path 
dependent, like it's not path independent. If you build a product, right, oftentimes, like, you know, as, as a DeFi founder, oftentimes you need to do something that doesn't scale in the beginning because you need to do something that doesn't scale in order to, to acquire your initial user base. You want to use your initial user base uh, to understand how your product works, to understand your users, to build brand loyalty, and uh, to spread the word, right? Basically, you want to make your initial user base really happy. And that's exactly how Uniswap really succeeded. So, you know, it, so just because AMMs, I don't, you know, I don't think AMMs will, will prevail in the long run compared to like older books, but it doesn't mean that you don't do it today. Um, it's, it's perfectly fine to build AMMs today because there are issues with the scalability of, of uh, the, the L1s, you know, the Ethereum in particular. Um, and uh, also currently, you know, crypto is very much low like volatility, which is very good for passive uh, market makers. So um, it's, it's, I think it's pretty fine to build AMMs uh, to bootstrap your initial uh, user base. And uh, in the long run, um, you can slowly transition into something that, that scales, uh, which I think in this case is uh, order books. Um, and in fact, you can build AMMs on top of order books. Um, order books should be uh, more prevalent as the, uh, as the L1s become more scalable. So you can do that. You, know, you, can, do, uh, you can make this progressive transition. And the user doesn't, doesn't even need to know um, that these things happen under the hood. right? Like From a user point of view, they can see the same user interface, like simple, intuitive user interface of you know, click on a few buttons, enter a number, and make the swap without knowing anything about what's happening under the hood um, about, about the protocol. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the topic I, I prepared uh, for, for this content, for this uh, presentation. Um, any, any other questions, feel free to, to shoot them. Uh, I think people are interested in uh, how market makers work. Um, just reading the, the, the question. OK. Um, is there anything I could add on, on the market maker side? Um, I think you know, one thing I would add is uh, I'm seeing more and more professional market makers, not the super big ones, not the super uh, like the largest traditional market makers, but some of the uh, crypto, -native, crypto native ones or the medium sized ones, they started looking at uh, making markets on, in DeFi this summer because, because of the growing volume. Um, so as a DeFi founder, uh, I, think, um, uh, I, I think you want to, I guess, maybe uh, spend more time uh, reaching out to these market makers uh, because they're ready. They're ready to trade on your platform. And uh, the, game, the game is probably going to become more competitive, but it's getting started. Um, another question here. Uh, do market makers involve themselves in any other DeFi projects other than order book DEXs? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, uh, lending insurance, yes, uh, most likely. Uh, I mean, some of the yield farming, uh, like some of the market makers that, that do yield farming, they need, to, they need some insurance uh, against a total collapse of the platform. So that's for sure. And then lending, yeah, I mean, uh, how do you do margin trading, right? Like, how do you short an asset um, when you make markets? You have to borrow from somewhere else, right? Um, so they definitely they're definitely involved with uh, in the lending platforms as well. Um, <laughs> some tips in trading for us? No, not today. Uh, where would you advise a market maker to get informed about derivatives, futures, margin? Um, I think the easiest way is to get in touch with the market makers, uh, with the DeFi projects themselves, with, with, the, with the founding team, um, because they are craving for professional market makers. And you guys are, like, as a market maker, you crave for information, for a nice onboarding experience. So just talk to each other. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's probably the best advice I can give. Um, any other questions? How to contact me? I mean, I'm 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 very uh, I'm very active on Twitter. I, I share everything. Uh, I speak my mind on, on Twitter. 
Uh, so you can find me, uh, QWQIAO uh, is my Twitter handle. Um, how to prevent listing of fake tokens on DeFi? What can be done? Uh, what do fake tokens mean? Uh, oh, uh, you mean in the sense like, uh, like someone launches a, uh, a token, uh, someone uh, tests in, in prod and launches a token. I mean, I mean, just, I guess, I mean, uh, I guess number one, uh, you wanna make sure that the token has been audited. I mean, if you wanna be really safe and obviously you wanna, you wanna see a front end, you wanna see a UX. Uh, which suggests that the product product is done is is completed, um, and uh, definitely don't ape into uh, these new shit ones that people people shill on, on Twitter. Don't do that. Uh, you're you're fully responsible for. I mean, I, I'm a big I'm a big believer in testing and prod, um, and I'm also a big believer that you know you should take full responsibility for your own financial decisions in in the crypto world because I mean crypto is built for immutable transactions uh, is built for people uh, who, um, uh, you know, who take ownership of all their transactions and trades and their financial decisions. Um, that's it. I mean, we're pretty much uh, hit the half hour mark. Um, thanks very everybody for the super great questions. Hope you enjoy it.